I have a great affinity for hotels, even the worst of them. No two are the same, and even a singular hotel is likely not the same for long, as they occupy different spaces at different times. They anchor you to a unique experience, good, bad, or indifferent. Well, except Hampton Inns, those really are all the same, like always. <laughs> but real hotels exist all over the world, and I've had a life that has taken me to them in spots in many corners and crevices around the globe. From saccharine sweet cocktails at Raffles in Singapore, to taxidermy filled lobbies in Anchorage, to sunrises in Zanzibar, to I have no clue where or how the bill was paid spot in Chile. In the worst and loneliest of times, hotels offer an escape, a refuge, a break from everyday life, and an opportunity to behave in ways you might otherwise not. <laughs> have enough of those kind of trips though, and it's bound to leave a scar. I have one dead center on my forehead, as a matter of fact. I was married at the time, I got it, and uh, it was not going well. And so the travel possessed an element of escape, a reprieve for me. And as with a great many ill-fated nights, there was karaoke involved. <laughs> I had killed it with a stirring rendition of Bust a Move. A charming blonde woman had picked up the backing vocals for me on Young MC's seminal track. She even kept up with me as we drank questionable cocktails with names like Sailor Boy. I ended up in bed with her and things were going well enough until I rolled out of bed for a quick trip to the bathroom. I discovered that as well as having a solid breakfast spread, the hotel also had bedside furniture with surprisingly sharp corners. Thanks to all the alcohol, I don't really remember what tripped me up, although I may have just answered my own question. And I did not feel a lot of pain when I hit the hideous carpeting. But the rush of warmth across the whole right side of my face let me know I was bleeding badly. I'm not sure if it was the spike of adrenaline, the sting of blood in my eye, or the taste of iron suddenly on my lips, but sobriety came quickly. I grabbed a towel and applied pressure to stanch one problem. I threw clothes back on haphazardly while also attempting to keep them clean. Ish. I grabbed a second towel and tossed that on the pooling blood on the ground, which thankfully was mostly disguised in the carpet's eldritch patterns and colors out of space. I then awkwardly pulled cash out of the wrong pocket for the hand that was free and left the biggest tip I could manage for the hotel staff. I said a hasty farewell that took entirely too long and then was on my way back to my room to tend to my wounds. I was in the midst of a period where I made more than a few questionable choices. I had a DUI a couple years before that and while I had changed my relationship with alcohol in a great many ways, I had not altered much when I knew I would not be driving. I had all manner of excuses at the time for the drunkenness for the post karaoke liaison and for cheating on my ex. Most of them were the cliches you're all thinking of. But really, I wasn't brave enough to change my situation then, either by improving things or by leaving. And therefore, I felt I needed a cover story for the diagonal cut across my face. And so the next morning, which came horrifyingly quickly, while evaluating the necessity of a trip to the ER, I also concocted a tale that I had tripped getting out of the shower and hit my head on the corner of the towel rack. In hindsight, it sounds implausible, but in my defense, it was an unusually high sill for a shower. And I actually do know people that have since tripped on it too. <laughs> Albeit not quite to the same catastrophic effect that I was claiming. In further retrospective clarity, my cover story was also not that different from what actually happened. I tripped and fell. But at the time, it was important to me that the impending scar was not from being drunk or from rolling out of the wrong bed. That was kind of a low point for me. Bleeding in a resort hotel room, worried about the integrity of your eye, while making up lies, will do that to you. That being said, while travel gave me places to behave in ways that I might otherwise have not, hotels have also been where I've made significant decisions to improve my life. I was in Charleston, more properly Goose Creek, a town for which the title suburb is aspirational uh, best. Uh, when my DUI and the next likely career option brought me to a crossroads. I was in the kind of hotel where you sleep on top of the covers because you know other things already occupied the bed proper. <laughs> it was a place that catered to traveling military members with little recourse to deal with the shabbiness of the accommodations. I was contemplating an option to take a new job based on the connections I had made, but it would mean the end of my initial dreams for a career. 
The new work was in an underserved, little-known bit of the military enterprise, focused on disaster release, re response, and recovery. A lot of my peers suggested I do everything I could to hold on to my original career path. But I was lucky enough to have a mentor that suggested I could do more good for more people in the new line of work. My mentor told me change was what I needed, and that, particularly, that felt particularly true as I watched the dimly lit room for signs of invertebrate movement. <laughs> and so I took the plunge. I embarked on a decade of work planning for the most catastrophic disasters possible and helping cities and communities prepare for them. It's rewarding in a way that driving submarines around could never be, and I'm not sure I would have chosen the work if not for how out of sync with my ambitions that Goose Creek Hotel was. Hotels themselves change and evolve as well. They age just like you and I, and they may even receive cosmetic surgery with mixed results, just like our friends here from LA might. <laughs> But despite that, some hotels are truly, and perhaps inexplicably, timeless. My new career later had me in Seattle, and I was staying on the waterfront at one of those kinds of eternally cool hotels. The Beatles stayed there, so what more needs to be said? My towel rack scar was beginning to fade. I was there to emcee a disaster response seminar with more than 150 people from various federal agencies, including someone from FEMA that had just been quoted in The New Yorker. As you'd imagine, an event like that requires a great deal of carousing. But I was fortunate enough to find a moment of solitude the day before. A whiskey sour with egg white and a view of the Puget Sound at the hotel bar brought a moment of clarity that I will be forever grateful for. As I watched a ferry cruise by behind a field of masts in the foreground, while the Olympic Mountains filled the background, I came to grips with the idea that while I had found the career field I wanted, I still was not happy with who I was. I was still enmeshed in the same type of lies that I was reminded of with every glance at my scar in the mirror. But I realized the kind of tranquility I experienced in that moment with that view was possible for me too. I ended an affair that weekend and I started down the path that brought me more honesty to my life and the path that eventually led me to, be, to a place where I could be more deliberate about the relationships I was in. Which leads me to a final lens through which I view hotels. While they can serve as reminders of experiences and markers for the passage of time, the, that theme of change extends to the experiences themselves. For instance, the hotel that gave me the scar has changed the story it tells for me. The tripping on the shower sill cover story had stood unquestioned, I think, for a decade. <laughs> that time recently came to an end, however, when my girlfriend and I were on a trip with my parents, my sister, and her boyfriend. It was a big crowd, actually, as my aunt and my cousin were there, too. As my marriage was long over and I had made that decision to be more honest, my girlfriend knew the real origin story of my scar. In fact, she was the first person I had been truly deliberate with as the person I wanted to be. We were all staying at a lovely, iconic hotel, enjoying an evening gin and tonic. The gin was Kanyagi, if you're familiar with it. I don't quite know how it came up, but she was teasing me about the scar and the night that gave it to me and my sister's interest was piqued. Her boyfriend, clever in his own right, noticed the change in her demeanor and was suddenly intrigued as well. <laughs> they both record scratched the conversation with the always effective, wait, what? <laughs> and I just laughed. I was happy to tell the real tale to my sister and her boyfriend. Well, in theory, at least. I did negotiate a reprieve and I haven't actually told them the story yet. My mom was there after all, <laughs> and I'm not sure she needs to know all the details. So I'm taking the chance to workshop it, and we'll see how it plays for an audience. <laughs> but regardless, I now have a new memory in a new hotel that marks the day I realized I don't need the cover story anymore. I also have another trip and hotel stay to look forward to where I will tell the karaoke scar story to my family. While my girlfriend and siblings tease me brutally, I am sure. And lastly, I have an old hotel story with a new meaning because of the people that are in my life and the love I have for them. Todd Stansfield, ladies and gentlemen, Todd Stansfield.